Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise and this is Tend to Life where we are talking all things true crime. I've got a case for you today that so many of you guys have been requesting and there are just so many unanswered questions in this and it's something that actually is like out there in a really big way right now. I think there's like Facebook groups about it. Everybody's talking about it. So I don't know why I haven't seen any other creators talk about it, but we're going to talk about it here because so many of you guys have been DMing me and messaging me and emailing me and it is a pretty puzzling case to say the least. Oh, and exciting news. I got another sample here today. Ah, sorry guys, of um, new merch that is coming. Gosh, I look like a like robber right now uh, or like a bandit, but I don't know if you could see it. Mm, it's embroidered and it says professional red flag spotter because you know, we are always spot in our red flags and there are a lot in this case as well. I don't think I'm going to be able to wear this the entire time because it's really hot with all the lighting in here. And where are my glasses? Oh, here they are. Hi, it's me. Okay, so sorry. Today is just, you know, it's the end of the week and I'm just, you know, feeling a little loopy. All right, so let's jump in. On January 27th, 2022, 15-year-old Austin Gabe woke up to get ready for school. It was Wednesday, hump day, and only a few days were left of school for that week. Now, or of that week for school. I don't know, however you would want to say that. Now, Austin began his usual morning routine, getting dressed, getting his backpack packed, and waiting for his older sister, Alexis, to get up and take him to school, like she did every other morning. So Austin waited around, but Alexis never came out of her room, and it turns out that Alexis wasn't in her room at all. So Austin figured that she must have gone somewhere earlier that morning or maybe just spent the night with a friend, but he was sure that she was going to show up to take him to school because Alexis would never just leave her little brother hanging, and she was always reliable. So watching the clock, it was apparent, though, that he was now going to be late for school and that Alexis wasn't coming. So after several unanswered calls to Alexis, Austin texted his older brother, Gwen, asking if he knew where their sister could be. And when Gwen told him no, Austin went to ask their parents, who were very alarmed that their daughter had not come home. So they called her friends, her cousins, and everyone that they could think of. And when her older brother, Gwen, started getting bombarded with calls from cousins and his parents, he knew that this was becoming a little bit more serious. No one had heard from his sister, and everyone had the exact same question on their mind. And everyone had the exact same question on their minds. Where is Alexis? So let's get into it. Sent to Life with Annie Elise starts right now. 24-year-old Alexis Gabe is a young woman who anyone would be absolutely lucky to call their friend. She has been described as creative, artistic, a jokester, and someone who could bring light to any dark situation. She has beautiful, long, shiny black hair with a striking but very warm smile. She lives with her family in an apartment in Antoich, a city in Northern California, and I really hope I'm pronouncing that city right because I believe that that's where my husband is from also. So living in this apartment was Alexis, her father, her mother, Rowena, and her little brother, Austin. She also has an older brother, Gwen Jr., who lives nearby with his longtime girlfriend, Morgan. Now, unlike so many families we see nowadays, the Gabe family was extremely close and always spending time together and creating memories together as a family. The Gabes are a Filipino-American family, and Gwen Sr. even has a YouTube channel where he shares Filipino recipes. Alexis's parents were so proud of her because she recently finished nursing school, and in addition to being just a great daughter, she was an amazing sister as well. Alexis took her younger brother, Austin, to school every morning and was always very responsible and dependable. The Gabe family communicates frequently throughout the day via text on a group chat. You know how it goes. If you have a close family or you're close with your siblings, you know the drill. And Alexis was in this chat and she would always let them know what was going on and definitely if she wasn't going to be coming home. So on Tuesday, January 26th, Alexis called her older brother, Gwen Jr., to ask if he would go and check if she had any packages waiting for her at the post office. Gwen agreed, and if she did have a package, they planned to meet up later so that she could get it from him, because remember, he lived with his longtime girlfriend, Morgan. So it's unclear whether or not Alexis had a package waiting, but since Gwen didn't call her to meet up later that day, I would assume that either she didn't get one or maybe he forgot. 
After Alexis spoke to her brother, she got into her light blue Infinity Coupe, left home, and headed to a neighboring city called Oakley to visit with her ex-boyfriend, Marshall Jones. Alexis and Marshall had recently broken up in November of 2021, but as most of us know, breakups aren't always cut and dry, especially when you've been together for three years like they had. There was a lot of history. Now, at around 6 p.m., Alexis had a text exchange with her dad, but when he texted her again at 7 p.m., he did not get a reply, and we're starting to build a timeline here in the very early stages of it. So maybe they were hanging out to talk things over, to get some sort of closure, or maybe even try to make a friendship work between them. Who knows? Maybe one of them also was trying to get the other one back romantically. But regardless, Alexis wouldn't be coming back home that night after her final visit with Marshall. Like I said earlier, Alexis always drove her younger teenage brother Austin to school. So when she wasn't there on the morning of January 27th, the first thing he did was try to text and call her. After his calls went straight to voicemail, he called his brother Gwen and found out that he hadn't spoken to her either. When Gwen Sr. and Rowena woke up to discover their young son still at home and not at school, the alarm bells immediately started going off that something just was not right here. They had no calls or texts from Alexis letting them know that she would be staying out, that she was with a friend, and her being such a dependable person, this was very out of character. They called everyone they knew, asking if they had seen or heard from Alexis, to which all of them had answered no. Finally, they decided to call Marshall, her ex-boyfriend, who they knew very, very well, but weren't aware that they had been seeing each other again or had planned to meet up. So Marshall answered their call to let them know that he did hang out with Alexis the night before, but that she left his house around 9 p.m. to go to her friend's house. The only problem was the friend that Marshall said Alexis was going to visit was out of town. She was over an hour away from where they lived and in Sacramento. Now, maybe Marshall misremembered which friend Alexis said that she was going to go and visit. But when the parents called Gwen Jr. back, their older son, he could hear the worry in their voice. Could she have gotten into a car accident? Could she be hurt somewhere? Or could she be in some kind of trouble? The wheels were spinning. Gwen started to make his way to his parents' house so that they could figure out what to do next. Feeling left with no other option, they filed a missing persons report for Alexis. The Gabe family spent no time messing around. Gwen Jr. and his girlfriend Morgan, who has essentially become a member of their family, have really spearheaded the search for Alexis from the very beginning. That same day, the whole family, along with extended family and friends, gathered and made a strategic plan of who was going to search, where they were going to search, and to see if they could find any sign of Alexis. The local police department and Oakley police joined together right away to begin searching as well. Just hours into the search, two of Alexis's cousins came upon a blue infinity coupe parked in a cul-de-sac on Trenton Street, which is just a 12-minute drive from Marshall's house. The doors were unlocked and the keys were still in the ignition. Alexis's cousins called the Gabe family and they quickly arrived at the vehicle, which they were absolutely sure was their daughter's. However, they didn't see anything too alarming inside the car, but there was still one place to check. Gwen Sr. asked his older son to open the trunk. Not knowing what he might find, Gwen Jr. nervously opened the trunk, which thankfully was empty. The relief of Alexis not being in that trunk was short-lived, though, because if Alexis wasn't with her car, she wasn't in the trunk, there was no sign of foul play, where was she? Alexis wouldn't have just left her car on a random road with the keys still in the ignition and the doors unlocked. And this, to me, right out of the gate, made it me assume that whoever is responsible left the doors unlocked and left the keys in the ignition because they hoped that the car would be stolen. That is my personal opinion. And we're going to keep talking about more of this in a second. But as soon as I heard that, I was like, oh, obviously whoever's involved wants the car to be stolen. That's why you would do that. So the police and the Gabe family started to feel out that there was now some sort of foul play involved and that wherever Alexis was, she didn't go willingly. Finding Alexis's car at least gave the police a starting point to begin asking residents and businesses for any security camera footage that they could obtain. And luckily, one resident had a security camera that was able to capture someone parking and exiting Alexis's vehicle and walking away. And the person who appeared to be male was wearing a face mask and a hooded sweatshirt. He looked to have some sort of facial hair poking out from underneath the mask as well.
The Gabes and the officers felt like the man in the footage resembled someone they knew, someone named Marshall. The police went to Marshall's house and he made a statement, but other than that, he wasn't being very cooperative and he seemed like he didn't really want to be bothered or involved in finding Alexis, which is just crazy because they were together for three years and together the night before. So with just that evidence alone, no one could be sure if Marshall was the man in the video or not, or if he was involved in her disappearance at all. They had to keep looking, and with the help of several police departments, hundreds of volunteers, and the Class Kids organization, over 200 acres of Contra Costa County were searched. Searches went out 20 times, but there was still no sign of Alexis. Now, over the course of the next couple months, the Gabe family agonized over not knowing where Alexis was. The police departments were keeping all of the evidence they had very close, hardly releasing any of the important evidence they had to the media and some not even to the family. And at some point between the end of January and May, a searcher found Alexis's shattered phone screen in some tall bushes near where her car was abandoned. The phone screen was sent to be tested for DNA and for fingerprints, and during this time, instead of assisting in the search for his ex-girlfriend or cooperating with police, Marshall left California, and he went to stay with friends in Washington. When the police first took his statement soon after Alexis went missing, they did an initial search of his home, but didn't remove much evidence. The second time, however, they removed several boxes, bags, and even a vacuum cleaner. So could Marshall have used this vacuum to clean up his house or even maybe Alexis's car after doing something awful to her? In Marshall's home, the police also found some small areas with Alexis's blood. They also got permission from the court to wiretap his phone so that they could listen to his conversations. Without releasing what made them come to the conclusion, the police held a press conference stating that they believe Alexis to be the victim of a murder. Now, this obviously shocked and horrified the Gabe family, but without a body, they remained hopeful that she might still be alive out there somewhere. In late May of 2022, the results came back from Alexis's phone screen, and it was discovered to have DNA and fingerprints that matched that of Marshall Jones. The police believed that they had enough evidence from inside his home, the digital and forensic evidence, and the surveillance tapes to now charge Marshall with the murder. The game family felt hopeful that if Marshall was arrested after all of these months, maybe he would confess and tell them where Alexis was located, because all they wanted to do was look him in the eye and have him tell them what happened and get some sort of closure and, you know, put Alexis's body to rest. So the arrest warrant for Marshall was granted on May 26th. A group called the Pacific Northwest Violent Offender Task Force, which is officers from several districts and regional jurisdictions, headed to serve the warrant. They arrived at an apartment complex in Kent, Washington, where Marshall was staying at a friend's home. And here is a video of what took place when officers arrived at the residence. The Gabe family won't be getting their wish of speaking with Marshall face to face. When Marshall lunged out of the door holding a knife, this caused police to shoot and he died on the scene. With the only known witness now dead, it was starting to feel like finding Alexis would be impossible. However, in a press conference explaining what happened during that attempted arrest, police made public that they actually believed Marshall did not act alone. So even with him dead, they still vowed to continue to search for Alexis until she is brought home. It's been made obvious that police are still holding on to some phone data and possible wiretap evidence because another arrest was then made. The police felt that they had enough evidence to arrest Marshall's mother, Alicia Coleman Clark, for aiding and abetting. However, the DA, Diana Becton, has received heavy public scrutiny because she decided that there wasn't enough evidence to charge Marshall's mom and she was released just four hours later. 
So with no more evidence surfacing, the police got a warrant to search Marshall's sister's home, where he allegedly tried to stay after Alexis went missing. When police got there, his sister handed over some crumpled pieces of paper. She told officers that she got these out of the trash after she found out that Alexis was missing, and she demanded that her brother leave her house. The crumpled up pieces of paper appeared to have directions written on them, and the directions are to a relatively remote city called Pioneer in Amador County, which is about two hours away from Oakley. Now here are some of the directions. You can see how specific and kind of bizarre the directions are written. It seems more like they're being written as someone explaining how to get somewhere with the use of landmarks, saying, pay attention, and things like that. It just doesn't sound like directions copied from Google or MapQuest. And the notes have been matched to Marshall through handwriting analysis, and when they were released, a friend of his also came forward with some disturbing information. He told officers that just a few weeks before Alexis went missing, Marshall had called him and said he wanted to kill Alexis. He said Marshall was asked where the best place to hide a body would be. The friend told him probably a septic tank or a forest, but was adamant that he thought Marshall was kidding. Ugh, God, this just kills me. It's like, again, I always say it. You hear something, you see something, say something. Whether you think he's kidding or not, even if you think he's kidding, why are you telling him where you would hide the body? Like, it just ugh, it infuriates me. He says that he had never even met Alexis before and thought that Marshall was just mad at her and was being sarcastic. And probably the strangest part of the directions were that they began starting from Marshall's sister's house, not his house. So was Alexis in his car, maybe, when he went to his sister's? Like in the trunk or something? And then he went inside and wrote down the directions? Did his sister give him the directions? Did he drive to where the directions lead and leave Alexis there and then go back to his sister's house? But if so, why did he leave them there? I don't know. There's so many questions. Like, why did his sister wait until months later when the police had a warrant for her house to then pass those papers along? And I'm sorry, I know I have a lot of questions. It's just all so weird and hard to imagine what he must have done after he abandoned Alexis's car on that road, just 12 minutes from his house. The police were able to find a ping of Marshall's cell phone in that area, even though it appears his phone was off all day. So he must have gotten lost or forgotten the directions, turned his phone on to use GPS, then turned it off again. I don't know. And I don't know about you guys, but it seems to me like the sister just must know more than what she is saying. Many locals have asked the question too of why Pioneer? The roads that he wrote down are well-traveled and the terrain doesn't seem like somewhere where he could just go on a casual hike, let alone deep into the woods to dump a body. As you can see here, it's all dense forest with steep cliffs. It definitely doesn't seem like he could have managed to take her that far from the road by himself. So if he didn't have help, Maybe he just stopped on the side of the road and pushed her down a cliff like this one located on one of the roads in his directions. That's one of the reasons why the Gabe family and police have asked that volunteers not try to search the treacherous region and that it needs to be searched by professionals. There are also two ponds in that area that have had over 8 million gallons of water drained just to look for Alexis. And police are even looking in residential and business septic tanks, per that tip from Marshall's friend. The most recent development has been the discovery of Alexis's phone case near where her car was left abandoned, as well as her cracked screen. Alexis had a custom phone case with a photo depicting the famous late rapper Tupac, so it wasn't difficult to confirm that it belonged to her. So that means two out of the three parts of the phone have been found, while arguably the most important third part has yet to be discovered. The main piece of Alexis's phone could provide the answers to her family, through texts, pictures, social media, and more data evidence for law enforcement. The Gabe family announced that they will be holding another search for the last piece of her phone and are asking volunteers to assist on Saturday, July 16th, on that same road where her car and her case and the screen were discovered. Although law enforcement has requested that volunteers leave searching the forest area and pioneer to the professionals, they also said that they aren't going to stop anyone from looking and gave some tips for those who do choose to search. This case has developed with such bizarre evidence, but I think it's just truly tragic that Marshall had to die before he was brought in to face his charges and to at least provide answers. Not only have they potentially lost their daughter, but now the Gabes have lost any opportunity to get answers from the person who most likely did this. In my opinion, it seems like maybe the officers kind of jumped the gun a little bit. 
Yes, we can see Marshall coming out of the door holding a knife, but they were wearing tactical gear and they had shields. So I wish they could have like tased him or maybe shot him in the leg or shot him with like, not like a potato gun, but what's that thing where it like knocks them down? Maybe it's a potato gun. I don't know. Because just killing him means he got off too easy and that Alexis's family doesn't get the answers that they need and justice can't be served. I also think that the sister and the mom know more information and it does seem like the police are trying to figure out who helped Marshall do this. The only thing that most people can't figure out though is why. He doesn't have a criminal background, so why hurt Alexis? Was he just that heartbroken over her? And some of her close friends have come out recently to say that Alexis confided in them about her relationship with Marshall. She told them that Marshall had actually slashed her tires on two separate occasions and had also threatened to kill her in the past. Her parents had no idea at the time that their daughter's relationship was so toxic and said that Marshall was part of their family when they were all together. Looking back on recent photos, Alexis's mom says that she now can tell how much weight she'd lost in the months before she went missing and that it must have been from stress and possibly sadness related to her breakup with Marshall, maybe even anxiety. The Gabes have said that Marshall was Alexis's first love, but why would she keep seeing him if he was possibly abusive towards her and causing her so much stress? But you know, honestly, it's not uncommon for victims of DV to go back to their perpetrators several times before ending it for good. You think that they'll change. You want them to change. Maybe you don't have the courage to leave. And if it's her first love, maybe she's just so hopeful that they'll have a happy ending. And in addition to their love story, regardless how messy it may have been, they did have a deep bond because Marshall and Alexis also were in a pretty serious car accident together. So many have thought that maybe there was also some sort of trauma bonding that kept drawing them back together. Marshall's mom has reportedly said that her son developed depression after the breakup with Alexis and that it was something he wanted to keep very private. His mother's boyfriend has admitted to a lack of support for her son after the breakup as well, and apparently he was not taking it very well. So maybe the motive is that he wanted to get back together and she said no and he snapped. Maybe he thought that he just couldn't live without her. I just don't see how someone could do that to a person that they supposedly love, but more so to a person that they want to control. So I'd really like to know what you guys think from all of this evidence. What do you think of the directions that were written down beginning at Marshall's sister's house? And why do you think that she kept that crumpled up paper until there was a warrant? Why not give it to them earlier or why not get rid of it, period? And what do you think that he could have done with Alexis? Where could she be? Someone from the area mentioned that it's doubtful he could have buried her because the ground during January would have been extremely hard and difficult to dig. The Gabe family is still holding out hope to the possibility of Alexis being alive somewhere out there. Like I said, they have asked for volunteers to help search for her phone, and I will put the information to her Facebook page where you can get all of those details and updates about this case. I really hope that the search in the forest in Pioneer yields some results so that the Gabes can at least know what happened to their daughter, who they just love dearly. You can tell how close and loving of a family they are, and they deserve to bring Alexis home. Hi, we are Alexis Gabes' mom and dad. You probably noticed that we have been very silent in the last three and a half weeks. Until now, we're still in shock and couldn't believe this is happening to us. Our son, Gwen Marcus, his girlfriend, Morgan, and Morgan's mom, Lori Marshall, have been leading the efforts to find Alexis, and we are truly grateful to them. I don't think we would be able to do what they did. They have accomplished so much. We would like to thank the Oakley Police Department for their hard work. I know some of you are probably wondering why they're not sharing any information about the case. We do get updates from them almost every day. We just couldn't share any information at this time because it might jeopardize their investigation. We would like to thank everyone who donated to the GoFundMe account. It helps a lot with expenses for our volunteers. But most especially the community. We were not expecting so much love for the billboards and the fundraising events by the Hernandez family to every single one of you who walked and prayed with us, distributed and posted flyers, tied black ribbons, and dropped off groceries. We want you to know how much we appreciate everything that you've done for us. Thank you so much. Please accept our endless gratitude. 
we are asking you this huge favor to please join us please help us find our daughter alexis <laughs> Alexis was last seen wearing a white tank top, a black and silver hooded jacket, black pants, and white and green Jordans. Police are asking for tips that could lead to finding Alexis with an award fund of $100,000. And I'm also curious to know what information the police has with that wiretap. Did he confide in anybody? Did Marshall talk to his mom or his sister over the phone via text, on the phone, whatever it is? And do they have some sort of information that way to where they're trying to just further bolster their case against one or both of those women and will that be the additional suspect who's arrested it seems hard to believe that he could have done this alone but maybe in any event please continue to keep alexis's family in your thoughts and prayers so that they can get the answers that they so desperately are seeking and that they so that they can get justice for alexis very soon I will continue to keep you guys posted as this case is rapidly unfolding. So if you haven't done so yet, make sure you subscribe, turn your notification bell to on so that you get notified of those updates when they happen. Thanks so much for tuning in today, guys. And please don't forget on your way out to not only leave your comments on this case because I'm interested to hear from you, but please give this video a thumbs up because liking the video helps kick it into the YouTube algorithm. It'll push Alexis's case and story out to more people. And the more eyes we get on this, the better because hopefully somebody will see have seen something or maybe saw like you know saw something that strikes a memory or maybe somebody who encountered Marshall at some point along the way over the last few months might have information and maybe this will help them you know be inclined to share it so whatever we can do to help guys all right thanks for tuning in with me i hope you enjoyed the case coverage and don't forget comment what your thoughts are below all right until the next case stay safe